We'll come this morning to Genesis 12. So if you have your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis and chapter 12. Let us read, let's pray before we read God's word. Heavenly Father, give us ears to hear. Speak that we would understand. Holy Spirit, give me the words to speak well of Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. God's promises, they never falter. They never fail. And I think for me, in my, you know, the, the prayer of my heart is, do we live our lives convinced and confident in the invincibility of God's promises? Let's look at Genesis 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, that is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say that you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abraham entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake he dealt well with Abraham. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. So Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy and inerrant word. Last week we began our study of the life of Abraham. After a number of weeks looking at Genesis 1 through 11. And as we come to Genesis 12, we see the action in Genesis slowing down and focusing on, on, on Abraham and his descendants. But see, for 11 chapters, we've been ranging across the globe. And we've seen creation. Creation. We've seen fall. We saw Cain and Abel. We had a global flood. Then we had the Tower of Babel. So we have nations spreading out all over the earth. We are spanning the globe. We have we have centuries, and now we focus on the remaining four-fifths of the book of Genesis, just on four generations of one family. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's offspring. Running from Genesis 12 to Genesis 23 is Abraham, and then a number of chapters after that, still pertain to certain lives in the life of Abraham, then the focus turns to Isaac and his descendants. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is the centre point in the history of these biblical promises. Everything that leads up to Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is preparing for it. And everything that comes after Genesis 12, 1 to 3 in the Bible is the fulfilment of it. So this is a real centre point for the promises of God. For the promises of God's 
covenant of grace. And the great theme of these chapters is the promised seed of Abraham. And then, of course, to Abraham as his name is changed. So his posterity at the very centre of these chapters, as well as to a lesser extent, the theme of the promised land. So you have this little group leaving the Ur of the Chaldeans, clinging tenaciously to the promises of God, that the Lord, the Lord will give a seed and the Lord will provide a land. Those two promises, the seed and the land. And the very final chapter of the section looks back to the certainty of return to the land of promise. And in Genesis 12, 1 to 9, we saw the outline of the covenant blessings given in verses 1 to 3. In verses 4 and 5, we saw that Abraham was beginning to live out God's commands. In the covenant of grace, God in his grace comes and blesses Abraham. Though Abraham does nothing to earn or deserve it. Nevertheless, God places requirements on Abraham. And the central requirement that he places on Abraham is that Abraham is to separate himself from his land, from his relations, and from the headship of his father's house. So, that, so there is a requirement that Abraham must fulfil in carrying out this mutual relationship which is a covenant. So even in the covenant of grace, which is established by God's grace, there are requirements for God's people. And this is seen in verses 4 and 5, as Abraham begins to follow through on God's command. And God's command was, go from your country, from your kindred, and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And then just recapping a bit in verses 6 and 7, Abraham pauses at Shechem. He builds an altar and offers praise to the Lord. And it's likely that that phrase, the site of Shechem, or the place of Shechem, actually indicates that there was a pagan altar there, that there was a pagan worship centre. So here is Abraham coming into the middle of the land of promise, not a stitch of it is, under, is his at this moment. It is under pagan control. The Canaanites are in the land. This is the centre of their pagan worship. Their worship to idols. And what does Abraham do? The first thing he does is build an altar to the one true God, the Lord, and he worships him. And that's why last week we finished with the only response to a sermon on Genesis 12 is to worship. Abraham proclaims the Lord's dominion over the nations, even when he is a stranger in a strange land. And at the very end of the section, in verses 8 and 9, Abraham's faith was tested in his wanderings, and he learned to live the life of a pilgrim. Abraham pitched his tent, he built an altar, which shows us his priority. He built a lasting altar to the Lord for worship, even though he himself was dwelling in a tent. And it's a great call that our priority in life is to worship God. That's why so, it's, I'm so thankful to see you here this morning. Worship is essential. It absolutely is essential to our life. And while it is not as we would want it to be in many ways, it is still gathering together as the Lord's people to worship the Almighty God the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Isn't that a tremendous thing? To lift our hearts. And that was Abraham's priority and it must be ours. So the first thing is the great themes of the Abrahamic covenant are the seed, the land and the nations. This is a difficult passage, but I wanted to set the scene by saying the great themes of the Abrahamic covenant are the seed the land, and the nations. So just three or four things from this passage. In verse 10, there was a famine in the land. So Abraham went down to Egypt, sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. 
And God is setting the stage for a trial for Abraham. You see, Abraham had, all, had already had to endure many trials of obedience to God's call. And I'm sure there are many here who can testify that. The trials of being obedient to when God says, go. Abraham had had to leave his native country. He had to go to an unknown destination. Even for the well-trod wanderers amongst us, and they know who they are, they usually know where they're going when they get on a plane. Usually. But he, Abraham left without knowing where he was going. And then he had to deal with his wife's childlessness in the face of God's promise to make him a great nation. Then he had to deal with the loss of his father. And we know these things because they're scripture. But even just for a moment, just to try and apply that to how it must have felt. Abraham had to deal with coming into a land and not finding a permanent home. We all have a home and instinct in some way, don't we? You know, we like home. We make home. But he had to deal with not finding a home, but living as a nomad. So it's interesting that our Lord Jesus had no place to rest his head. But Abraham had to deal with being surrounded by idolaters on every side. And now there's also, added to that, there's a famine. There's a famine in the land. And a proper famine, not when the shelves in the supermarket run out of toilet roll. No, this is a, this is a proper famine. This is a famine. The Lord is testing Abraham's faith and faithfulness. So verse 10 is setting the stage for the rest of the event as it unfolds in verses 11 through 20, which I read. So this verse sets the stage for a story which reveals the sinfulness of a great man. Which, which by the way, is, tells us that it is absolutely real. Because if this was a legend, why include this? Why even think about this? If this, is, this is Abraham. Abraham, though he was a great man, was a sinner. So we, this, we see the sinfulness of a great man set by side by side with the grace of a great God. But before we look at the passage as a whole, it would help us to remember the themes that are set forth in the promise of God to Abraham in the blessing of verses 1 to 3. Because each of these themes has a role to play, not only in the passage today, but in the ongoing passages that we will come to. God promises to Abraham blessings in verses 1, 2 and 3. And there are three main features to the blessing. And I would, I'd love us to just be ingrained in your heart and soul, the promise of a seed, the promise of posterity, then the promise of the land, and then the promise of the nations. And these promises are repeated throughout the story of Abraham, right up to Genesis 23. Genesis 12, verse 2 is, And I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. God promises that he will be a great nation. And that promise has to do with the seed, with the posterity that he will become a great nation. And then that picks up in Genesis 13 and verse 16. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. So again, this theme of the posterity that God is going to give to Abraham is brought to our attention. A couple of chapters later, Genesis 15, verse 5, and he brought them outside and said, look towards heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Again, God's promise concerning the sea. A chapter later in Genesis 16, verse 10, the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring, so they cannot be numbered for multitude. Genesis 17, verse 2, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. 
So over and over in God's dealings with Abraham, over and over, he stresses the blessing of posterity. That God is going to give Abraham descendants. That God is going to give him not simply an heir, but he's going to make him the father of a great nation, the father of nations. And the second theme is the theme of the land. And we first pick that up in Genesis 12, verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. A chapter later, Genesis 13, verse 15. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. Genesis 13, verse 17. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. Genesis 17, verse 8. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Again, over and over, God's dealings with Abraham in this section, he's repeating the promise of the promised land, the blessing of the promised land. Not only posterity, we see the land. And I want you to see the third theme, because these are the three themes that God promises Abraham. We pick it up in Genesis 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonours you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The promise is for the nations. It's a threefold promise. Posterity, land, nations. God blesses Abraham in his covenant promises and says he will be a blessing to the nations. Just look at this theme quickly as it's carried out. Genesis 18. Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah have come to the Lord's attention and God is about to bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to the counsel of the Lord. Genesis 18, verse 17. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So there, there is God, who, who, he's about to bring judgment on the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. He stops to say, I must tell Abraham this, because in him, all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed. He was getting ready to bring judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham needed to be able to intercede. Genesis 22. In the wake of God providing a substitute in the sacrifice of Isaac, we read, And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Over and over, the blessing that Abraham will be to the nations is mentioned as the promises of the covenant are reiterated. Now it is interesting to reinforce that, to remember that, that's vitally important, but it's precisely in these three areas that Abraham is tested. It's precisely in those three areas, the posterity, the land, and the nations that Abraham is tested. Think about the promise of posterity. He's promised posterity and Abraham's wife Sarai is 90 before she bears him a son Rebecca his daughter-in-law went 20 years before she bore a son and Abraham was still alive do you realise what that must have been like and please don't just brush it off by saying well they lived to be donkeys years old there this, this, but this is the promise of posterity. And a 160-year-old Abraham, having gone through all the pain of waiting with Sarah, now waiting for his son's wife to have a child. This man's faith was tested over and over and over. His faith is with regard to his posterity. So, so he was tested when it came to the promise of his seed. But then he was tested for the promise of the land. Not only is Abraham sent from his home country to a place where he doesn't know where he's going, 
Hebrews tells us he didn't know where he was going when he started out. The Lord has said, go, I will take you there. Mind you, what a safe place to be in. I thought about that. What a wonderful place to be. But not, not, only does, not, 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 not only goes to a country that he doesn't know, but he's a stranger there. And when his wife died, he had to buy a parcel of land to bury his wife. He didn't own a fragment of land at his wife's death at the age of 127. Abraham's faith is tested in the promise of the land. Hebrews 11 reminds us that Abraham died without the promises of God being fulfilled to him in regard to the land. And think again of the test in regard to the nations. Abraham was to be a blessing to the nations. But even when Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, judgment fell on them. Abraham was to be a blessing to his neighbours, but in this chapter, and in Genesis 20, Abraham is a problem for his neighbours. Abraham's neighbours take his worlds. Abraham's neighbours steal his nephew Lot. Abraham has to engage in warfare. In every single one of God's promises to Abraham, God tests him. Do you see a pattern emerging there? And this, is, this was a truth that my parents taught me, and I've always been thankful for it. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. Man's extremities is God's opportunity. And I want us to think about that even in our current crisis. Many people are at extremity. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. Because it's in the trials of life that we go one way or the other. It's in the trials of life that we go one direction or another. We either revert to bitterness or our faith grows stronger. And we know that to be true, isn't it? In the trials of life, our faith is, is, you know, is encouraged and we stand tall. Or we give in to bitterness, sniping and jealousy, and division. And in the midst of all Abraham's trials, and we might also add in the midst of Abraham's failings, we can say God grew Abraham by grace, and Abraham persevered to the end. Which is an example for you and I, because it's precisely in the areas of God's promises to you that I promise you he will test you. It's the, it was the promises that he made to Abraham. They, they were his testing grounds. And just as he tested your father, Abraham. And that sets the stage for the incident that we see here. And the first thing we see is that the covenant promises are endangered by unbelief. Verses 11 through 13. We see a failure in Abraham's character. Frankly, we see a display of cowardice on Abraham's part here, and we see a failure of Abraham's trust in God. Abraham would not have resorted to this if he had trusted God in the terms of the promise. And we see in verses 11 through 13, the covenant promises are endangered by unbelief. You see, Abraham has been promised by God the Lord would give him a seed, and the Lord would give him a land, and the Lord would make him a blessing to the nations. And then Abraham endangers all of these things by his behaviour. They go down to Egypt. And as they go into Egypt, Abraham knows his wife is beautiful. And Abraham also knows, and we have copies of the law in Egypt from this time, that Pharaoh had the right to take any wife and children of a stranger coming into his land. Now probably that would not have been done normally with a dignitary like Abraham. But Abraham's faith breaks down. And, when, and he knows that when he goes into Egypt, it's likely that one of the local lords is going to try and kill him for his wife. Or that Pharaoh will hear about her beauty and he'll get rid of Abraham and take her for, his, for him. So his faith breaks down. His faith breaks down. It's a breakdown in trusting the Lord. 
But even as, as I said at the outset, as it is a breakdown in the trust of the Lord, it evidences the truthfulness of this passage. This passage has been brought under great ridicule by liberal critics of Scripture. They mock how in the world could a woman 60 years old be considered to be beautiful, that so much so that Abraham would be considered in danger of his life because of her presence. Sarai lived to be 127 years old. Or maybe she was in the prime of her womanhood at this time. But it's interesting in the parallel passage to this, it doesn't mention her beauty. When Abimelech tried to take her, it was because he wanted a marriage contract and a treaty between him and Abraham. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily her outward beauty that enticed her, but now she's in, still in her prime, she's a beautiful woman, Abraham fears. And we also know from the times that it was a very common thing for people from Haran to take their half-sisters as their wives. In fact, it was a status symbol to be married to your half-sister. It was such a status symbol that if you married a woman who was not your half-sister, men would adopt their wives as their sisters in order to raise their social standing. It doesn't fully make sense to us today, but it is what it is. It was a big deal in the time. So we see numerous things which confirm the historical accuracy of the account. Abraham uses a trick from his culture to protect himself in an alien culture, the culture of Egypt. Nevertheless, Abraham is endangering the covenant blessings. And when we come to this passage, I want you to imagine the children of Israel gathered around Moses, delivering the story of how God through his plan of redemption, was going to raise up a redeemer for Israel. Moses, to bring them out of the land of Egypt as God's representative. And here they're listening to the story of the promised seed, and suddenly they see the father of the faith trying to give away the mother of the faith. And they say, no, don't do it, Abraham. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. But Abraham's lack of character shows through here. Derek Kidner says, Abraham's craven and torturous calculations are doubly revealing, both of the natural character of this spiritual giant. You're seeing what this man would have been like without grace. There's nothing that can, can claim Abraham for himself. John Calvin used to say, there is nothing of our own in our good. There's nothing of our own in our good. Abraham, apart from grace, was a coward. But we're also seeing something else. The sudden transition that it is possible for the same person to make from the plane of faith to the plane of fear. And that is, that is a cautionary tale. Because one of the greatest weaknesses, even for Christian ministry, is tiredness. And thinking that you're owed a rest or you're owed something because you've been ever so busy for the Lord. It's very Easy, and apart from faith and keeping close to the Lord, to slip from the plane of faith to the plane of fear. So Abraham, only a few days maybe before, was buoyed by his faith in God. He built an altar in the presence of his enemies. He worshipped in, in a place of pagan worship. And now he's asking his wife to lie and endanger herself and her virtue, her reputation and the future of God's promises so he might be protected. You see, even heroes of the faith are sinners and need to be saved by grace. And this is a testimony to the truthfulness of Scripture. If we'd have been making this up, would we have ever said this about the father of the faithful? But because God's words are true, he records the good and the bad about his faithful servants. He had another testimony to the truthfulness of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the authority and trustworthiness of Scripture. Now from this great lack of faith where Abraham says to Sari, tell them that you are my sister, is technically true, because Sarah was his half-sister, but it's in danger in the promise of the covenant.
The next point is that the covenant promises are preserved then by the Lord's intervention. We see in verses 14 to 17 that though Abraham fails, the Lord God does not. The Lord sees, just as he saw in the slopes of Moriah, he saw Sarai in her hour of need. And we see that God's covenant promises are preserved by his sovereign intervention, not by us. God's covenant promises are preserved by his sovereign intervention. Even though Abraham is faithless, the Lord is faithful. Abraham goes down into Egypt. Just as he anticipated, the Egyptians see that Sarai is beautiful. They begin to talk about her. Word of her beauty gets all the way to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I have to have her in my harem. We know that pharaohs of the day very much liked Syrian women in their harems to complement the other women that, who were already there. So Pharaoh hears about Sarai and says, pick her out, bring her to me. Pay for her to her master. And just, so, just as Abraham had planned, he received a great deal of wealth from Pharaoh and he gave Sarai to the harem of Pharaoh. But when Abraham is faithless, the Lord is faithful and he strikes Pharaoh in his house with plagues. That reminds you, doesn't it, of another thing that he did in Egypt? Great plagues in the house of Pharaoh. Genesis 12 is a foreshadow of what God is going to do in his redemption of the people of Israel in days to come. And then that brings us to the next point, verses 18 to 20, the final two verses. The heir of the covenant castigated by the nations. And Moses has made no comment about the morality of what Abraham has done. But I want you to note the Lord places through Moses' pen a rebuke of Abraham from the mouth of a pagan. Think of it. A godly man rebuked for his untruthfulness by a pagan. Now what do you think of what Moses thinks about what Abraham did? Moses is telling you when you see Pharaoh, the godless Pharaoh, rebuking the father of faith, Abraham. Moses is telling you that Abraham's faith failed here. So we see the heir of the covenant, Abraham, being castigated by the leader of a foreign nation, Pharaoh. But I want you to see as well, alongside that rebuke and alongside, by the way, of yet one more testing of the promise about Abraham being a blessing to the nations. Is he a blessing to Pharaoh? Hardly. He's the cause of curses and famine coming upon his house. But I want you to see three things that we see in the Exodus. It is famine that brought Abraham to Egypt. Just as it is, it is famine that brings the brothers of Joseph to Egypt. God visits plagues on the house of Pharaoh. Just as in Exodus, God visits plagues on the house of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh gives God's covenant heir plunder and wealth and riches, just as the Egyptians gave to God's people upon their departure from Israel. Genesis 15, book of Exodus, many riches. Moses is drawing a parallel here so that in this one event in the life of Abraham, again, don't you see it wonderfully? It's prefiguring the great redemption that God will bring to pass one day in the future in Exodus. And it's accompanied by, not because of Abraham's faithfulness, but because of God's faithfulness. That's why we sang, great is thy faithfulness. And therein is a lesson for us. We do not learn from this, of course, that we should be complacent about our obedience because God will dig us out of the mess anyway. That isn't the message. The message should make us tremble at the thought of what we do with God's promises to us. But it is to remind us that in the very last instance, it is not our faithfulness that assures us of the, con of the continuance of the promises of God. It is God's faithfulness and the grace which he works in us. You cannot survey the life of Abraham and say it was Abraham's righteousness that caused God to love him. When you survey 
the life of Abraham, you see, every goodness I see in this man is the result of the grace of God. He was just another man from the land of Ur of Chaldeans. God, by grace, called him and called him to be the man of promise, to be the fountainhead of the promises of all those who trust in Christ. He is our father. Yeah, Abraham is our father in that way. We are the children of Abraham. So the story also is a word, should be, as, as I close, a word of rebuke, but a word of hope. It's a word of rebuke because God admonishes us. Never think the end justifies the means. Never think that, you've, that you're smarter than God. That God doesn't know what he's doing. And he needs us to take our own path outside his word. Outside his way. In order for God to get his work done. It's a word of rebuke to us. Let us run the race to God's finish line. Let us run the race according to God's law. And trust in him to fulfil the promise. But it is a word of hope. It's the last thing I want you to hear this morning. It is a word of hope. That nothing, nothing and no one, no one can derail the promises of God. Absolutely nothing. The woke scene we see in the world today, the people saying, what, what did God really say all over? Nothing will derail the promises of God. And I hope you don't get tired of that theme because that's the theme of the book of Genesis and it should strengthen our faith that God will not be thwarted. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing will ever derail the promises of God. And that is a word of hope for you personally. You may think that the way that your life has turned out or you think that I have ruined what promises God has made to me through my willful behaviour. You have not. You haven't ruined his desire to bless you. If you belong to Christ to bless you with the promise of Abraham, if you in faith are a child of Abraham. So never think that you have short-circuited God's plan. That you have no blessing and no kindness left from God. Surely that isn't the lesson of Abraham. It isn't the lesson for us personally and it should be a hope for us corporately. We see so many reasons to be discouraged. I've been on the phone the last few weeks to churches that haven't been able to meet in any way at all for, over, for about a year now. They don't have the online capabilities. They haven't the ability to meet in person. We, we, there, there's so many reasons to be discouraged. And then we see secularising forces. And we see people who will persecute the church. And there are threats from without. But if you know church history, the greatest dangers come from within. It's not hard to see scandal. Fallen leaders. Sinful division. Theological error. And think if only we could get out of God's way. Many of you would have read the news stories the last few weeks about Rabbi Zacharias. The sin, the deception, the manipulation, the abuse. And it's easy to look at the faults of God's people. And only the Lord knows what was ever on in Rabbi Zacharias' heart. But it's easy to see and to be discouraged by fallen pastors or leaders. Or to see problems in theological missteps and wonder how is God going to build his church but we must rest confident in the promise rest in the promise not in any one of us rest confident in God's promise please pray for your pastor please pray for pastors pray that we would stay faithful but ultimately it's Jesus' promise who, who did Jesus say would build his church? I will build my church, Jesus said. Thank the Lord, it's not up to me. Jesus says I. He may use other people. He may give, give gifts in people, in writings, in sermons, in parents. But Jesus does it. It is ultimately Jesus who builds the church.
Not any author, not any pastor, but Jesus. And he says he will build his church. It belongs to Christ. So we can have absolute confidence this morning, brothers and sisters, that though we get in the way, <laughs> like Abraham, 10,000 billion times, Jesus will build his church. He will build his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's not an excuse to be lazy, for disobedience, but it's a reason for hope. And I don't know what God is up to in the church, in our town, in the country, around the world. But I know this, he will be true to his word. He will build his church. And nothing will ever derail the promises of God, not even us. Not the world, not the flesh, not the devil. God will have his way. God will build his church. There will be, the, the, there will be eternity with the saints from every tribe and nation worshipping around the throne. And by God's grace, we get to be there. But through the seed of Abraham, he will bless his people and he will bless the world. Do you believe that? Does, does that give you hope? It should do. Because it's not in what I say, it's in what God has done. And the hope is in the promise. May the Lord bless the word for his glory and for our eternal good. Amen.